Hello all. Welcome to this uh, session on a uh, discussion on human physiology. Today I will be discussing a few important concepts of uh, circulation and body fluids. Since all uh, since this session is intended for people who are uh, about to take NEET in 2018, I assume that you know the fundamentals. So I will be discussing a few things which you might have missed out or a few conceptual things which needs which needs to be cleared for you to have a clear understanding of the concepts of circ circulation and body fluids. Body fluids, you, you, are, you are aware that you, you, are, you are told many times that the body is predominantly made up of fluid and it's about 70% fluid, 70% water. But the, there is compartmentalization of this fluid. The entire body fluid you can, come, you can just segregate into extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. Fluid which is inside the cell is intracellular fluid. Fluid which is outside the cell is extracellular fluid. Pretty obvious. In the extracellular fluid, that is fluid which is outside of cells, there are two, way, two places where you can find this fluid say, uh, you know, compartmentalized. One is within the blood vessels and the second one is in between cells. So the fluid that is inside blood vessels is called intravascular fluid and the fluid in between cells in the tissue space is called interstitial fluid. So if we look at it, there are three compartments in which fluid is found in the body. One intracellular compartment that is called the first space second intravascular compartment or the second space three interstitial compartment or the third space the relative distribution of fluid in these three compartments is always a constant you need to understand this it's always a constant this is required to understand lymphatic system so generally there is a limitation for many students in understanding the lymphatic system i'll touch upon that but understand this three compartments first Intracellular compartment is the first space, intravascular compartment or the fluid which is within blood vessels is the second space, interstitial compartment or the tissue fluid is the third space and relative concentration or relative volumes of these fluids in these three compartments is constant. That means if the fluid in any one compartment is reduced, either there should be a redistribution or replenishment of that fluid which has been lost from a particular space. Keep this in mind. We will, we will revisit that after I, after I introduce to you another concept. Circulation in humans is um, uh, closed circulation. That means blood does not get out of blood vessels or blood is not supposed to get out of blood vessels under normal conditions. But everything that the body requires, everything that the cells require, starting from oxygen to nutrients to hormones, a lot of things required for the sustenance of life is circulating in blood. The thing is, if blood does not get out of blood vessels and the cells, about 100 trillion cells in a human body require the require material which are present in blood and the materials that are to be discarded by the cells have to be put into blood and the blood does not come in contact with these cells. How is it that there is an exchange of material between blood and the cells? If, if I'll, I'll write a few uh, things here, Come consider this to be blood vessel where there is blood these are the this is a mass of cells which is which is a which is a tissue let us say so this is the first compartment this is the second compartment and if you see this is the third compartment that is the interstitial, interstitial space every cell is bathed in tissue fluid there is fluid around every cell which is the interstitial space material that is required by the cells is in the second compartment and there is third compartment or the tissue fluid between the blood and the cells one very important thing that you need to understand is the blood vessels are not watertight. That means as the blood vessels start branching more and more, let's say the arterial system, as it branches more and more, the size of the blood vessels become smaller and the walls become thinner. As the walls of the blood vessels become thinner, the blood vessels tend to have pores. So it is it is porous. There can be there can be exudation or getting out of fluid from the blood vessels into the surrounding space. So there is diffusion of material from the blood vessels into the tissue space and from the tissue space into the tissue or the cells. Likewise, if there is to be a backward flow that needs to happen, if, 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 if we consider only the forces of diffusion, there is diffusion of material from the first compartment into the third compartment, that is the interstitial space, and from the interstitial space into the intravascular space or blood vessels. So this is another thing that you need to know. Lymphatic system, if I may introduce to you right now here, the lymphatic system has three components in it. One is lymphoid organs. The second one is lymph, the fluid. And the third one is lymphatic vessels. 
Now consider this, if there is, if the blood vessels are porous at the periphery and there is exudation of fluid from the blood vessels every time the blood moves through these vessels, there is a risk of the blood becoming lesser in volume and thicker in consistency. If that happens, the circulation will get affected because increased viscosity will lead to sluggish circulation. So the fluid that has gone out of the second compartment, that is the intravascular space, has to be put back. And I also told you that if there is an imbalance of fluid in any of these compartments, it has to be restored. In this case, when blood is flowing through the blood vessels, there is loss of fluid from the second compartment, that is the intravascular compartment, and there is gain of fluid in the third compartment or the interstitial compartment, tissue fluid. I told you, either it has to be restored or it has to be rearranged. So the fluid that has come in excess into the interstitial space should be put back into blood. Lymphatic vessels are the vessels that begin at the tissue space and continue to join together to form bigger and bigger vessels which will terminally end at the heart, which will open at the heart and end at the heart. <coughs> Excuse me. So considering this, how, what, what do we uh, call as lymph? The excess fluid that has been exudated from the blood vessels into the tissue space as long as they are in the tissue space is tissue fluid. But once they start getting into the lymphatic system, that is the lymphatic vessels or the lymphoid organs, the fluid that is being circulated within the lymphatic system is lymph. What does this lymph contain? Apart from the fluid component of blood that has exudated, some, compart some components of the tissue space, nutrients, WBCs, all of this constitute lymph. The fluid which has been drained from the tissue space and which is continuously moving towards the heart to restore the volume of blood is lymph. Lymphatic vessels are designed to carry the lymph back from the tissue space to the heart. So if you notice, unlike blood vessels, lymphatic system is not a closed system. It begins at the tissue space and ends at the heart. It's not a closed system there. Blood vessels are closed. It begins in the heart and ends at the heart and there is no discontinuity at any level of blood vessels. Lymphoid organs. Lymphoid organs are the organs which will contribute to sequestration of WBCs or maturation of WBCs. Sequestration of WBCs is compartmentalization of WBCs. You know, well, we, since we are not discussing immunity here, I will just touch upon the lymphatic system and lymphoid organs and get back to it. So we, we need to talk about the body fluids and circulation here. There are two types of lymphoid organs, primary lymphoid organs and secondary lymphoid organs. Primary lymphoid organs are bone marrow and thymus gland in humans. These are the two places where in, in, in bone marrow there is maturation of B lymphocytes and in the thymus there is primarily maturation of T lymphocytes. These are the primary lymphoid organs. Secondary lymphoid organs are the organs that you find everywhere in the body. In the mouth, you have tonsils. In the, no in the nose, there are adenoids. There, is, there are lymph nodes everywhere in the body. There are uh, lymphatic tissue associated with the gut. It is called gut associated lymphatic tissue associated with mucus, mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. There are pears, pears patches in the intestines. All these are lymphoid organs. Their specific purpose is to allow sequestration or compartmentalization of WBCs, allow settling of WBCs where the WBCs can act as the first responders in times of need. That is whenever there is an infection or an injury. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is about the lymphatic system. Now you know about the three compartments, intra, intra, intracellular compartment, extracellular compartment, first space, second space, third space. We'll limit at this. Another concept in um, uh, circulation that you need to know is the, the force which brings about circulation of blood. Blood, <coughs> excuse me, blood is the fluid that carries most nutrients. Blood is the fluid that brings about exchange or movement of material from one part of the body to another part of the body. Now for blood to circulate, blood to move, which is which is moving, the, there is there need to be a channel through which blood moves, and that channel, the, the, that network of channels is the network of blood vessels. What determines the pressure at which blood flows within this system? There are two components in the blood vessels. One is the arterials, arterial network and the other is the venous network. Arterial network is the network of blood vessels which carry blood away from the heart and venous network is the network of blood vessels which carry blood towards the heart. When blood is being carried away from the heart, if you remember the definition of blood pressure, it is defined as the pressure exerted by the pumping of ventricles on the walls of the arteries. 
Now, our ventricles are pumping blood at a particular pressure and that pressure is transmitted along the arteries. But as you move away from the heart, the pressure decreases and by the time the blood reaches the capillary network, arterial capillary network, the pressure is very less. So, the pressure has almost died down to a very insignificant level, the level at which it cannot come back to the heart. That is one aspect. So, what brings blood back to the heart is a, is a question that we need to answer. And the second question we need to answer is, how much pressure is to be created by the heart? You, you talk about blood pressure being uh, 120 millimeter mercury by 90 mm, 80 millimeter mercury as the normal blood pressure. Blood pressure is always a range. Around that is normal. Why does blood pressure increase as people age? What are the factors that determine the pressure at which heart has to pump blood? Now let us analyze this a bit logically. If you think of fluid flowing, uh, water flowing through a network of pipes, how much pressure is required to pump water through the network of pipes? You know, any, any substance that allows movement of fluid will, uh, will offer some resistance to the movement of that fluid. If a tube is allowing fluid to pass through it, it offers some resistance. And if you want the fluid to continue flowing through that pipe, you need to ensure that the pressure you exert on the fluid will be higher than the net resistance offered by, the, uh, by all the forces that are trying to prevent the flow of that fluid. The network of blood vessels is no different. The network of blood vessels offer some resistance to the flow of blood. There are three components associated with blood flow which will, in, which will offer resistance to blood flow. Now the heart has to pump blood at a pressure higher than the net resistance offered by all these forces. In that case, the blood will flow. Otherwise, the blood flow stops. Blood flow becomes sluggish or it stops and there is failure of circulation. What are these forces? Blood is flowing through blood vessels. So if we, uh, there are two factors associated with blood vessel itself. One is the size of the blood vessels and the second one is the elasticity of blood vessels. You know, logically, if you have a bigger pipe and a smaller pipe, the pressure in the smaller pipe is higher. The resistance offered in the smaller, uh, the resistance offered by this smaller pipe to the flow of blood is higher than the resistance offered by the bigger pipe. So, <coughs> if the blood vessels are bigger, the resistance offered is lesser. So, the heart has to pump blood at a lesser pressure. If the blood vessel is smaller, the resistance offered will be higher. So, the blood has to be pumped at a higher pressure. The second factor is elasticity of blood vessel. If a tube is elastic, the pressure that is lost by hitting the wall of the tube is restored back because the elastic, elastic wall tries to push the fluid back into the flow. So a more elastic tube offers less resistance than a less elastic tube. So if the, if the vessel wall is more elastic, if the blood vessel is more elastic, then the pressure with which the blood has to be pumped is lesser. That means a uh, well a robust and an elastic network of blood vessels will reduce the blood pressure or will keep the blood pressure lower if the resistance offered or if the elasticity becomes lesser or if the vessels become rigid. The resistance will be more and the blood pressure rises. The third component which contribute to blood pressure is the blood volume. Again, we, we you just think logically if you have to pump more volume of fluid through the through a given lumen size of an of a tube then you will have to exert more pressure so more the blood volume more will be the pressure with which the heart has to pump blood there are three factors that we have defined now i can i'll just give you a small table remember this it will help you answer most of the questions that can be asked at this stage about blood pressure there are three components that I told you. Three components, size of the blood vessel. So this is blood vessel and this is blood. Size of the blood, blood vessel and elasticity. Third one is blood volume. We can have one more here. If the size is more and the size is less, Elasticity is more, elasticity is less, blood volume is more and the blood volume is less. 
two factors you can consider. One is what happens to resistance. Resistance to blood flow. The second one is blood pressure. Third row also you can include where you can just write the relationship between the factor and the blood pressure. If the size of the blood vessel increases, resistance to blood flow decreases. If it decreases, resistance to blood flow increases. So if resistance decreases, blood pressure decreases. If resistance increases, blood pressure increases. If elasticity of the vessel wall is more, then the resistance to blood flow will be lesser. And the if the elasticity is lesser, resistance will be more. So blood pressure will be lesser if resistance is lesser. Blood pressure is more if resistance is more. If you are finding it difficult to follow right now, you can pause the video and revisit it. If, if the blood volume is high, resistance to blood flow is higher. If the blood volume is low, resistance to blood flow is low. So blood pressure increases when there is higher resistance. Blood pressure decreases when there is lower resistance. The relationship is blood pressure is inversely related to size of blood vessel. If the blood vessel is small, resistance is more. If the blood vessel is more, resistance is less. Blood pressure is inversely related to elasticity of blood vessel. Inversely related to elasticity. Okay, if the elasticity is more, blood pressure is less. If the elasticity is less, blood pressure is more. Blood pressure is directly related to blood volume. The questions about this relationship has been explored many times and many students get it wrong. Pressure volume relationships don't apply to fluids. That is volume and pressure are inversely related. It, is, doesn't, apply, it doesn't apply to fluids in the first place. And here, definitely not with blood pressure. So, I think um, uh, a good understanding of blood pressure should be obtained with this table. You can write down this table. Any question that is asked about blood pressure, you can answer. If you are asked about a, a, a relationship between something, some factor and the blood pressure, you just have to think, what will that factor do to the resistance offered to blood flow? If, that fa if the increase in that factor is increasing resistance, then that, will, that factor is contributing to increase in blood pressure. Now you know, you can, you can think of those suggestions that people give, doctors give when uh, advising hypertensive patients. You are told, uh, the hypertensive patients are told to restrict salt intake. Why? Intake of salt will increase the amount of osmotic substances in blood. Salt, sodium chloride is an osmotic substance. An osmotic substance will increase osmotic pressure. With higher osmotic pressure, there will be more fluid retention. If there is more fluid retention, the blood volume will become higher and blood volume becoming higher will increase blood pressure. So cutting down on salt intake will reduce that additional component of increasing blood pressure. Salt restriction helps in that way. And one more question I had asked you in the beginning of this session. Why does blood pressure become higher as we age? If, if you are a person of in, in the age 16 to 20, I would, I would say your uh, blood pressure being at 120 to 80 is normal probably. It's always a range as I told you earlier. If you, are a, if, if you are a person in the age group of let's say 45 to 50, I would say even uh, 130, 136, 1, 136 to 86 or 140 to 140 by 90 is also normal. If you are an elderly person, I would not consider much about, uh, I would not consider much uh, to be, uh, I would not consider your blood pressure to be very high if it is uh, even 150 by 90. As we age, the blood pressure increases because the elasticity of blood vessels become Uh, the elasticity of blood vessels become uh, lesser. If the elasticity become lesser, then the blood, blood pressure increases. So this is one factor. Another small concept that I want to um, discuss in this session, in the short duration that we have is about uh, uh, angina pectoris and um, um, myocardial infarction. Angina pectoris and myocardial infarction. As the blood vessels, as there is flow of blood vessels, there are two concepts that you need to know. There are two things that you need to know to understand angina pectoris and myocardial infarction. Atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis. Sclerosis means hardening, hardening of vessels. Atherosclerosis or arteri arteriosclerosis means hardening due to damage of the arterial wall. Let us assume that there is damage at this point, the point that I am marking right now, there is damage of the vessel wall, there is loss of elasticity. 
hardening of a vessel wall or loss of elasticity of the vessel wall or the damage to the endothelium of the vessel blood the inside of the blood vessel the inner lining is called endothelium and it is glass smooth very smooth any damage to endothelium will make the surface rough and that is a, that, that causes a tendency to attract cholesterol deposits so there is sclerosis there is damage to this blood vessel wall it attracts some deposition of calcium and cholesterol and other substances and there is an evolving block to this vessel this vessel starts getting blocked because if there is cholesterol deposition there is more cholesterol deposition it attracts it attracts more a precipitate will attract more precipitation will create will cause more precipitation so there is a decrease in the lumen size blood which is flowing in a streamlined manner up to this point will have to pass through a narrow lumen causing the pressure to increase at this point of block and further damaging the vessel wall beyond that also so arteriosclerosis is hardening of the vessel due to damage of the vessel wall this deposition of cholesterol on the vessel wall is called atherosclerosis a t h e r o atherosclerosis that even, even the, whenever there is deposition on the vessel wall on the inside that will cause hardening of the vessel wall too so if the hardening is due to deposition of cholesterol it is atherosclerosis if it is due to damage to the vessel wall it is arteriosclerosis if you notice if there is damage to the vessel wall it will lead to cholesterol deposition so arteriosclerosis can lead to atherosclerosis in this case in the first case in the second case if you notice atherosclerosis has happened and this can lead to high pressure flow hitting the vessel wall beyond that block causing damage to the vessel wall so in case two atherosclerosis can lead to arteriosclerosis so one can lead to the other and complicate the situation when there is a block and let us say uh, i'll just this is a blood vessel assume this is a part of the heart muscle which is being supplied by this blood vessel there is a partial block to this vessel under normal conditions when there is no high demand for blood this this vessel can be supply this vessel will be able to supply blood to this muscle but suppose there is a there is an increased demand the person is doing some unaccustomed heavy work the blood flow the supply is not being able to match the demand when the supply demand mismatch happens the muscle the heart muscle will start using up anaerobic respiratory means to get its energy needs anaerobic respiration will lead will lead to accumulation of lactic acid accumulation of lactic acid will trigger pain so there is a higher demand for oxygen which the blocked vessel is not able to supply the the heart muscle accumulates lactic acid due to anaerobic metabolism pain the person collapses demand is cut supply will be able to restore balance this is an indication when a person collapses with chest pain and he recovers after a bit of rest it is an indication that there is some block angina pectoris angina translates to pain and pectoris pectoral muscles are the chest muscles pectoris refers to chest angina pectoris directly translates to chest pain it is due to demand supply mismatch and it always happens during some heavy work if this block is partial now it can try it can completely lead to complete full blockage if this blockage becomes a complete blockage at any point of time it need not be during activity it can be during rest also there will be complete cut down of blood supply to the concerned muscle and that leads to death of the muscle that is the, whose blood supply has been cut off infarction means death myocardial infarction myocardial because myocardium myocardium is the muscle layer of the heart the blood supply to the muscle layer of the heart which is the bulkiest layer in the heart is if it is cut off any segment it leads to the death of that particular segment of the muscle which has been cut off from blood supply so the moment that happens the body's compensatory mechanism sets in and it tries to increase the lumen size to restore blood supply to that damaged muscle or the muscle that has been cut off from blood supply but these vasodilators or the uh, or the or the chemicals which will bring about dilatation of blood vessels or increase in the size of the blood vessels will not act only on the one that is blocked it will act in general on all the vessels of the body do you remember that i told you that blood vessel size if it increases leads to fall in blood pressure if the blood pressure falls below a critical level circulation cannot be maintained one of the factors that leads to death in myocardial infarction myocardial infarction is what is commonly referred to as heart attack one of the factors is 
there is cut off of blood supply to a particular segment of the heart muscle it shoots off a signal to the brain telling that there is severe supply you know deficiency of oxygen the body's compensatory mechanism comes into play it tries to open up that blood vessel by releasing vasodilators to to increase the size of the vessel but these vasodilators act in general on all the blood vessels if the restoration of blood supply happens then the vasodilator release will go down and the person can recover but if the vasodilators are released but the restoration of blood supply is not happening body continues to release more vasodilators causing rest of the vessels to dilate but not but this one when the vasodilatation crosses a critical limit circulatory failure happens and that is called circulatory shock that leads to probable death this is myocardial infarction angina pectoris myocardial infarction in this i think uh, we should stop at this stage because in the in the time that we have for this session i have been able to touch upon a few very crucial aspects of circulation and body fluids which are generally missed out in terms of understanding we have discussed about the lymphatic system the formation of limb different compartments of the body fluids then uh, blood pressure how to understand what factor influences blood pressure in what way then about uh, uh, atherosclerosis arteriosclerosis angina pectoris myocardial infarction pretty much we have discussed today that should be sufficient for this discussion we'll take a few questions before we conclude the session please explain the cardiac cycle mere momen okay heart has to pump blood there are four chambers the upper chambers are receiving chambers lower chambers are pumping chambers i'll quickly run through it mere momen we'll just uh, um, it's okay blood comes into the upper chamber enters the lower chamber gets out of the lower chamber into the vessel that is concerned right from the left side of the heart you just just remember a few conventions left side of the heart deals with oxygenated blood right side of the heart deals with deoxygenated blood upper chambers are always receiving chambers lower chambers are always pumping chambers so blood comes into the heart through the upper chambers goes out of the heart through the lower chambers that much is simple there from the left side blood oxygenated blood goes through into the aorta and gets to gets into circulation for the entire body from the right side blood gets into the pulmonary artery and goes into the lungs to get oxygenated cardiac cycle is the sequential events that happen in the heart which facilitate receiving and pumping of blood when the heart is receiving blood it's it, it's like if you want to uh, allow a compartment to take in something you need to make that relax so when the heart has to receive blood whether it is the upper chambers or the lower chambers atria or the ventricles it has to relax the state of relaxation of the chambers of the heart is called diastole the state of contraction when the heart chamber squeezes is systole consider a situation where the heart is completely empty nothing is happening now blood enters into the heart it enters into the upper chambers what should the state of the upper chambers be it should be diastole it is relaxing to allow blood to be filled up the there are valves between the upper chambers and lower chambers which hold the blood from getting into the lower chambers or backflow there is constant increase in the pressure exerted on the valves by the blood that is being filled up in the upper chambers when the pressure exerted on the valves the valves cross a critical limit the valves open passively making the blood flow into the lower chambers the excess blood which made this valve open starts flowing into the lower chambers ventricles now ventricles are receiving blood it also has to be in diastole the atria is are is also atria are also in diastole ventricle is also in diastole so this is the brief moment when both are in diastole when that excess blood flows into the lower chambers the valve tend to close but the upper chambers have to be emptied before it relax before it uh, it allows the valves to close so now the upper chambers goes into contraction to squeeze out the remaining blood into the lower chambers upper chambers or atria is in systole ventricles are in diastole because they are receiving blood immediately after systole of the atria atria relaxes to receive blood again ventricles are pushed they are pushed and the impulse reaches the ventricles and ventricles will go into systole so if you notice in the cardiac cycle the systole the, the atrium and ventricles cannot be in systole at the same time but atrium and ventricles can be in diastole at the same time 
consider this. Let's start with atrial systole. When there is atrial systole, there is ventricular diastole. Atrial systole ends, ventricular diastole ends. Atrial diastole begins, ventricular systole begins. When atria is in relaxation, ventricle is in contraction. Ventricular systole ends and ventricular diastole begins, but atrial diastole will extend a little bit further. This is the point of joint diastole. That's what I told you. When the valves open passively and blood flows into the ventricles passively for a brief moment. So what do we have? Cardiac cycle when you are talking about this is atrial systole again, ventricular diastole. You start at some point and end at that same point. Let's say we start at the beginning of atrial diastole. Let's say we begin here. I'll change the color. We begin here. You have atrial diastole and ventricular systole. At this point, you have joint diastole, then atrial systole and ventricular diastole. So it is a coordinated sequential event. When atria are in systole, ventricles are in diastole. When ventricles are in systole, atria are in diastole. There is a brief moment when there is diastole of both atrium and ventricles. The purpose is pretty simple. Allow the heart to receive and pump blood. When it is receiving, it cannot pump simultaneously the same chamber. So when it receives, it relaxes diastole. When it has to pump or squeeze out blood, it contracts systole. I think this should give you a basic summary of um, um, cardiac cycle. With this background, just go back to your book and study. It becomes much more easier. Not able to see. Explain blood clotting. Hmm. Smith wants to know about blood clotting. Whenever there is a breach in the when there is a breach in the blood vessel, if there is a breach in the blood vessel, the blood, RBCs in general, which should not have come out of blood vessel, start coming out. When there is RBC oozing out of blood, over blood vessel, there is activation of certain enzymes which will stimulate the which will stimulate you no know, sticking of platelets together. There are two types of clots that you will find. One is a thrombotic clot or the platelet clot and the second one is a fibrin clot. Platelet clot is called the temporary clot and the fibrin clot is called the permanent clot. There are a series of clotting factors which will which will participate in a cascading reaction. Cascading reaction is activation of one will the, the activated first first something will lead to the activation of something else that leads to the activation of something else and finally fibrinogen gets activated to fibrin. Initially when there is a when there is um, bleeding platelets go and seal off that you know uh, rupture or that bleeding spot holding the blood for a while holding the blood for a while the platelet clot is not hard so it cannot hold for a longer time it has to be supported by fibrin now let's say this is the this is the breach this is the breach now in this point of breach during the sequence of formation of permanent clot, fibrin will form a loose mesh around this wound which will also have platelets embedded in it. So formation of fibrin mesh and then retraction of the fibrin mesh. It's like you are weaving some threads together and pulling it by the ends. You are creating a literal mesh around that uh, on that surface of the wound, on the surface of the injury to the vessel and pulling that so that it becomes a tight cloth. This clot which forms is called the permanent clot or the fibrin clot. See the, the measure of platelet clot is called bleeding time. Bleeding time that is whenever you sustain an injury which is not of a serious nature, whenever the arteries are not damaged, the blood should stop the blood clotting should happen within 3 to 5 minutes. Bleeding time is about 3 to 5 minutes. That is when the platelets will form the clot. The measure or the uh, indication of the health of formation of this fibrin clot is called clotting time. It is about 12 to 15 minutes. It takes about 12 to 15 minutes for the fibrin mesh to form. So with clotting you have to remember temporary clot formed by platelets alone and permanent clot formed by a fibrin mesh. 
the measure of that platelet clotting mechanism is is bleeding time so if there are deficient if there is deficiency of platelets as in the as in the case of um, uh, dengue when there is decrease in blood platelet count bleeding time will be increased the person will take longer time the, the person's blood will take longer time to form an initial clot because the number of platelets will be lower so bleeding time is a measure of platelet activity clotting time is a measure of coagulation cascade or the sequence of events that take place to form the fibrin clot please tell me once again why blood pressure varies after age with reason sir please and why the lymph vessels decrease for some reason okay lymph vessels don't decrease as with any vessels the lymphatic vessels are also subject to uh, wear and tear they are also subject to rupture they are also subject to hardening so the lymphatic flow may get affected with age and with age blood pressure increases because the vessels become hardened the vessels become less elastic they tend to become more rigid because throughout the life as we go ahead the vessels take some wear and tear wear and tear of the elastic vessels lead to hardening of the vessels loss of elasticity if elasticity decreases remember resistance to blood flow increases so with increased resistance to blood flow the heart has to pump blood with a higher pressure to overcome that resistance that is why as we age the blood pressure increases because the resistance offered by these hardened blood vessels is more and the heart has to pump blood at a higher pressure i think that should um, clear that confusion of yours about age and blood pressure okay i think uh, uh, this should be the end of our discussion for today i hope that you have uh, learned a little bit more than what you have already learned keep studying keep studying do consistent hard work it's um, pretty near your need is pretty near and uh, consistent effort for the next 4 5 months should do good for you you can uh, run through some of our videos there are a lot of lectures available on our um, byju's app you can go through that you can post some questions also if you have any i will be able to answer them thank you all the best good luck to your exams thank you